Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Tom Harley and I'm chairman of the Menzies Research Centre. And I'd like to welcome you all here today and thank you for your interest in public policy. I'd, wel I'd like to welcome uh, a lot of the leadership of the Parliamentary Liberal Party, the shadow ministers, uh, members and senators. And I'd like to welcome my fellow directors of the Menzies Re Research Centre. Last year, at the last federal executive of the party, uh, the, the federal executive decided to augment our, the, the directorship by the appointment of several new directors, and two of them are here today, Andrew Abercrombie and Paul Espy. Also appointed was Maywan Kaur, uh, and Andrew Robb rejoined the board. Uh, the board also includes Arthur Sinodinus, David Kemp, Michael Osborn, Tony McClellan, and uh, of course our executive director, Julian Lisa, who will be talking in a moment. I'd like to thank our sponsors of today, uh, Huawei. Huawei. Above all, I'd like to thank you and our contributors uh, for another service. Uh, it's not the pro uh, our contributors in another sense, the public policy professionals who've come to contribute their ideas and analysis. Many of our speakers today carry no partisan flag, but all carry great expertise and share the concern that we all have about the future of our countries and the, uh, the of our country and the issues that need to be addressed. Tony has engaged, uh, he's invited us and demanded of the MRC a, a, rig a vigorous program and has offered us a big role in, assi in assisting in his policy development work. Today is the first of a series of roundtables we'll hold over the year. Other roundtables will focus on productivities, productivity, tax, welfare, uh, energy, among others. Uh, we want to put front and centre issues that have oft too often have fallen from public view. Uh, the MRC has done roundtables before. Uh, between 2006 and 2008, we ran an annual state policy roundtable. These were hugely helpful. Uh, in, in the progress made in policy formation in Western Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, it helped expand our party in those states, expand their thinking and has prepared them for government. When we held our 2007 state conference, in opening the conference I made this warning. Modern state governments seem more interested in power than in policy. Labor has struck a model of government that has perfected a triumph of expediency over policy. The opportunity cost to Australia is enormous. Last, uh, later this year, this was when I was saying this in 2007, Mr Rudd, a state Labor man, will ask the Australian people to extend the same sort of policy-free management of his colleagues, Peter Beattie, Morris Yammer and others. Australia cannot afford this on a national level. The message is clear. We cannot let Labor do to the country what they have done to the states. I repeat those words not to, prov not to prove any capacity for prophecy, but rather to underlie that here in Canberra we now have the worst features of government that we have seen in all the Labor states. Labor are slowly doing to Australia, in fact I don't think it's slow, uh, what they have done to New South Wales. Our job at Menzies through these round tables is to turn the tide of debate back to policy. Other MRC projects you will have seen are our book on federalism, uh, education book that we're being written by teachers, and a small business uh, task force modelled on the work Charlie Bell did in the 1990s. Not all our work is public, but we hope all of it is influential. It is all coordinated by Julian Lisa, our executive director who tirelessly runs this program with very little financial support, uh, but a lot of enthusiastic support. Um, uh, Huawei has been uh, generous and has committed itself to good public policy by its sponsorship today. I hope others will follow that example. We won't have, I believe, good public policy without a strong MRC and other think tanks. Uh, we can't do this without your support. So there are donation cards, uh, and I'd ask you to contribute money as well as ideas. Uh, I'd now like to call on Julian Lisa. Julian.
Thank you very much, Tom. Tom has outlined our broad program for the year and the role of the centre. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're trying to achieve through today's roundtable. I think one of the things that makes today's roundtable, which is called the way we live now and the way we will live tomorrow, so different, is its breadth. We're tackling, I think, three key issues that will infuse all of the policy work that we'll do across the next year. The question of the economy, its strengths, weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats that we face, both domestically and internationally. Our demography, not just questions of the ageing population, but uh, uh, what, uh, what, what, what does the increased life expectancy mean for us? How are our living patterns changing? Uh, what is the sort of work we're undertaking and what's the type of quality of life that we all aspire to? If we link these two sessions, I think we hit on possibly the single greatest public policy challenge facing Australia today and one that we don't often talk enough about. If we are not careful, we will be very soon hit with the double whammy. Not only will we have to pay back $90 billion or over $90 billion of debt that Labor has racked up, but at the same time, will be faced with the increased expenditure caused by the ageing of the population. That's why we need to take steps now to create an efficient and leaner federal government so that the, that the demands of the ageing population peak at that time we're not taxing a younger generation to an extent that it will discourage initiative and enterprise. That sort of initiative and enterprise we particularly need to grow our economy and increase living standards. And it's the increase in living standards which brings me to the third session, something that I think we too often neglect in public policy and in political terms, and that's the question of science and innovation. If we are to improve our living standards over the coming generations, we need to have a greater focus on this area. Forty years ago, Australia was a great world leader in the area of science and innovation policy, and over the years, we've slipped and allowed other nations to catch up. It's important that if in the next generation we're to continue to grow the pie, that we need to reconsider our policy there. We need to make sure our fundamentals in, edu in education, in maths and science are very strong, that we have the right investment mix in relation to uh, uh, capitalising on the ideas that are developed here. I want you to think of our mining boom. It would not have been possible without the developments in science and innovation in, the, in that particular sector. And there are further developments in science and innovation which will allow Australia to move into other sectors with greater prosperity. As Tom said, and is always the case, we're very grateful here at the Menzies Research Centre that distinguished Australian experts with no partisan flag have agreed to be part of today's roundtable. And that's something that I think that uh, really distinguishes the work that the Menzies Research Centre does. And I particularly thank all of our speakers today. And we're also very grateful for the ongoing and generous support of the Huawei company, and I'd encourage, as Tom said, um, uh, any other people who are interested in supporting public policy to fill in your donation cards and to come and see me at the, uh, at the break. Now to Tony Abbott, who uh, is, is going to open the conference. Tony, last year you were a giant slayer. You took the party in a perilous point, almost on the brink of oblivion, and you got it to its feet. You fought with great tenacity you brought down a serving Prime Minister and you lanced the parliamentary majority of a hugely disappointing first term government. That's a huge achievement in basically 12 months. Can I say this year the task is perhaps even greater? At a time when Australians need our government to get serious about the, challenge, the challenges that face us as a nation, our current government flails around, lacking the intestinal fortitude to see reform measures through being dictated to by minority voices and mired in a morass of gesture politics. This year, the challenge is to provide bold policy leadership, which is lacking in Australia. Not merely a policy posture that seeks to stop the bleeding and fix the problems, but a policy that looks forward with optimism to what we can do to make Australia a better, richer in every sense, and more productive place for the next generation. When the next election comes, it will not be enough to refight the battles of 2010. The caravan will have moved on and the country will demand more. Tony, the Menzies Research Centre is here to assist you in your, and your team to provide the bold leadership that Australia needs. We're here to develop the policies with you and to help you push the envelope. It's with great pleasure that I invite you now to open The Way We Live Now and The Way We Will Live Tomorrow. Well, Julian, uh, thanks very much. It's uh, great to be here. 
Uh, it's good to see uh, so many distinguished thinkers uh, and people interested in public policy here today. Uh, it's great to uh, be in the presence of my friends and colleagues and my deputy, Julie Bishop, the Shadow Treasurer, uh, Joe Hockey, and also our policy convener, Andrew Robb, and our deputy policy convener, uh, Tony Smith. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, we are determined to be the party of reform in this country. We want to be the party of reform. We want to be the party of ideas. And what you will see today is that we are also the party of debate. In fact, you may have seen quite a bit of debate from us uh, over the last week. Very vigorous uh, debate, because one thing that can never be said uh, about the Federal Parliamentary Liberal Party is that we are a team of parliamentary zombies, uh, or yes men. And uh, what we are seeing today uh, is very much in keeping with our character as the party of debate and reform and ideas uh, in our country. And reform matters because today's reforms are the basis of tomorrow's prosperity. The genius of our society, in fact the genius of our civilization, is that we have never been content with what is. We have always been asking ourselves what can be better. Uh, and in its own way, uh, this process today is a part of the ongoing strength of our culture. We are a strong economy today, uh, not because Mother Nature made us a strong economy. We are a strong economy today because the reforms of our far-sighted forebears have made us strong. It is the reforms of previous governments, far more than the spending spree of the current one, which has given us the economic strength to get through the global financial crisis relatively unscathed. But I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we do not have, at this point in time, a government of reform. And the more the Prime Minister insists that she is interested in reform, the more shrill and unconvincing she sounds. The only two changes this government has made that are worthy of the name reform uh, were the My Schools website and the extension of welfare quarantining uh, to unemployment beneficiaries more generally in the Northern Territory. Both of those changes were based on the work of the previous Howard government and both of those changes were fully supported uh, by the opposition. But apart from that, this government uh, has rolled back uh, 20 years of workplace relations reform and has turned a $20 billion surplus into a $50 billion deficit. So ladies and gentlemen, by contrast, we are the party of reform. We are the party of lower, simpler, fairer taxes. We are the party of smaller government and greater freedom, of stronger families and of respect for values which have stood the test of time. Above all else, we are the party of what works and of what can pass the common sense test. And if I try to distill those instincts and values uh, into a few simple phrases, what we want from Australian government is lower taxes, no more waste, better services, stronger borders and a fair go for families who are increasingly suffering cost of living burdens, many of them made worse by wasteful government. Good government fundamentally lives within its means. Good government doesn't spend $50 billion on a telecommunications white elephant. Good government doesn't spend $16 billion on largely unnecessary school halls. Good government doesn't spend $2.4 billion on roof insulation, which we now know uh, has not achieved even its uh, stated objective. Good government uh, doesn't announce a tax levy and tell us that it will raise $1.8 billion when it can't actually tell us how many people it will impact on. So as a coalition, the Liberal and National parties have been utterly determined to ensure that government always lives within its means. Uh, at the election, uh, we announced $50 billion worth of savings. And that was going to fund 
$40 billion worth of more effective government spending. It was going to result in a $10 billion plus improvement in the overall fiscal position and it was going to result in $30 billion less net debt uh, over the forward estimates period. At the election, we took to the people policies for better services from our great public institutions. We wanted more independent public schools. We wanted hospitals that were genuinely locally run and at least had the potential uh, to be nationally funded. We wanted to move more people uh, into the workforce. We wanted more mothers moving into the workforce. That's why we had a fair income paid parental leave scheme. We wanted more young people moving into the workforce. And that's why we were offering them uh, commitment bonuses and relocation allowances to move off welfare and into work. We wanted more seniors into the workforce, which is why we were paying employers real money to provide real jobs to potentially productive older people. We had a plan for more effective government, for more responsive institutions and for a more productive population. It was a good plan and our challenge now is to build on that plan in the weeks and months and years ahead. And these forums are an essential part of that process. Today, we're going to take a snapshot of where our society and our economy is today and where it is likely to be on the basis of existing policies. And I want to thank all of the distinguished speakers who are contributing to these discussions today. Over the next 12 months, there will be a series of further Menzies Research Centre forums. There'll be a forum on getting better value for money uh, out of government. There will be a forum on getting more people into the workforce. There will be a forum on making our schools and hospitals more effective and more productive. There'll be a forum on genuinely improving the environment without prejudicing our economy. There'll be a forum on getting better telecommunication services without recreating wasteful government monopolies. These forums will inform the policy that we take to the next election. It was good policy that we took to the last election, but policy must always evolve to meet changing circumstances, and that's what these forums will help us to do. But I want to stress, these forums are your events, not ours. We don't want anyone at these forums to be labouring under a straitjacket of conformism. We don't want anyone at these forums to think that there is a party line that has to be towed. No. What we want is to uh, be able to draw on the ideas, the thinking, the research and the analysis of the best and brightest in Australian society and that is what these reforms, uh, th these forums are bringing together. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we meet, in the theatrette of this parliament, I am conscious of the heavy responsibilities that are on the shoulders of all policymakers right now. For a quarter of a century, we had strong reforming governments of both political persuasions. For a quarter of a century, we had many significant groups in our society that were helping to drive that reform process, but it's absolutely clear that reform has stalled since 2007. Forums like this are a vital part of ensuring that the challenge of reform is not shirked, that it starts again, and why shouldn't it start here today? Thank you, Tony, and thank you for the, the role you've given us in, 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 in your project. Uh, we're now going to move to the, the panels. Each panel is different. In the economics panel, we've got two substantive presentations by Saul Eslake and Mark Thurwell. Uh, in the demographic panel, we have one specific presentation largely on domestic uh, demographics. 
then a paper on Asia, Asian regional demographics before some commentary. In the science and technology session, we have a substantive presentation and then two pieces of commentary and discussion. After we've heard from the invited guests, I will invite the relevant shadow ministers to chair the questions and, uh, uh, and discussion session and to ask the first question. All audience members, regardless of whether you're members of parliament or, uh, uh, or not, are free to ask questions and should first state your name and wait until the microphone comes before participating. Uh, uh, just before I call the first speaker, I'd just like to warn all, f all the speakers that Julian will hold up a sign when you have five minutes to go, uh, two minutes to go, and then I'll hold it up when you've got one minute to go. Um, now, the, there's a slight change in, in, in the order. The first speaker will be Mark Thurwell, uh, and he will be followed by, by Saul Eslake. Uh, Mark's uh, 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 brief CV is in, in the program, but Mark has substantial international experience. We're, 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 d we're d dividing this into the international economy and then the domestic economy. Um, he's uh, uh, worked with the Bank of England, uh, with JP Morgan, and uh, with our own EFIC. He is now at the, uh, at the Lowy Institute. I think it's, it, it's really, really good that our first two speakers are from two other think tanks, nonpartisan think tanks, and it is, it's great that our think tank and, and these nonpartisan think tanks are playing a part in public policy. Um, I would now like to call on Mark Thorwell. Um, thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the Menzies Centre for the opportunity to be here today and of course thanking our very distinguished um, audience and guests for the opportunity to speak to them. Um, it's a great privilege. So my brief is to talk for 20 minutes about the world economy and to give you a feel for where we're going. So this is going to be unashamedly big picture hand-waving stuff. And I thought because I'm doing big picture hand-waving stuff, I'm going to give myself the excuse that economists normally don't have, and I'm going to not do PowerPoint slides. So you'll just have to listen to me, I'm afraid. You won't get the pretty pictures. <laughs> not, not everybody hates that. That's good news. OK, what I want to do is I want to talk about the big forces that are shaping the world economy, both over the coming decade and over the decades past that. Um, and to do that, I'm going to do a little bit of history. Sorry, but we, we need to have a bit of context here. Because so, I'm going to start with two long-running structural shifts in the world economy that have a, a deep history, but which are going to sort of come to their climax, I think, over the next couple of decades. And then I'm going to look at some of the current contemporary circumstances and how they interact with those long-running structural shifts. So the first structural shift, which I'll talk, talk briefly about, is a demographic one. We are now pushing through, at a global level, the tail end of what de demographers call the demographic transition. Um, this demographic transition is the idea that, first of all, mortality rates fall, then fertility rates fall. Um, as a result of that pre-transition, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Post-transition, we live longer and hopefully happier lives. Now, this process kicked off a long time ago, round about the 1800s in Northern Europe. And it's been running ever since. And it's got two interesting implications. Interesting implication one is what it does to population growth. So as you'd expect initially, as, as mortality declines, population growth spurts. It speeds up quite rapidly. And then over time, what happens is your population starts to age and population growth slows. We're in the sort of the tail end of this process. I mean, demographers argue how long this will take, but very crudely speaking, this probably we're in the final century of the transition process. It started off in Europe in what we think of as the developed world and has been running since through the developing economies. So one thing that that's done is it's changed global population. If you think round about 0 AD or 0 CE, depending on which little acronym you prefer, global population is maybe, and we're, we're guessing here, there weren't too many demographers and statisticians around back then, we're guessing it's about 0.3 billion. It takes us to, until something like 1804 to grow the global economy to about 1 billion people. It then takes us about 123 years, 1927, to add on the next billion. It then takes us maybe 33 years as the demographic transition is kicking in, as population growth is ramping up, to add on the next billion. So we get to 3 billion by 1960. By 1999-2000, we've gone from 3 billion to 6 billion. 
Last year at about 6.9 billion, and on the old UN projections, we'll get new ones a little bit later this year, but on the old ones, around about August this year, the world economy ticks over the 7 billion mark. Around about 2050, we get to over 9 billion, about 9.1 billion people. So the first and most obvious and fundamental point about where we're going in the world economy is more people, and lots more people. Second is where those people come from. Because that demographic transition kicks in at different stages across different economies, that increase in population from 6.9 billion to, to, to 9.1 is overwhelmingly, almost completely, going to take place in the developing world. The big growth is there. Population in the developed world is stabilizing on average. There are differences across countries, but on average you're getting that stabilization process. Second interesting thing about this is the, the, the different dynamics of aging. Because that demographic transition process involves an aging population, then the world economy overall gets older. So you have more people, but on average they're older people. Um, one way of measuring this is sort of the old age dependency ratio. So we take the ratio of people aged 65 and above to the ratio of what the working age population, 15 to 64. I suspect those ages are going to shift in terms of what we define a working population, but that's kind of the current definition. 1950, that ratio is about eight. In other words, for every eight people who are 65 and over, you've got 100 people in the working age population to support them. And by last year, it's about 12, so half again. By 2050, at a global level, it'll be 24. It'll have doubled. But again, you have this big difference between what happens in the developed and the developing world. In the developed world, it goes from, again, roughly around 24 now, 24 people per 100, to by 2050, we think, we guesstimate, about 50. So 50, 50 over 65 to be supported by every 100 under 65 working age. For the developing world, the transition is actually faster. The ratios change more quickly, but from much lower levels. So currently, that ratio is around about 9 per 100. Um, so round out where the world as a whole was in 1950. By, by 2050, about 23 per 100, roughly where the developed world is now today. So we have older people, but we have a demographic imbalance, if you like, between the developed and the developing world, assuming no big shocks to fertility or mortality rates that we haven't thought about yet brought in. So older population, bigger population, and a more urbanized population. 2009, something dramatic happened in historical terms. The first time ever, more people in the world lived in urban societies than they lived in rural ones. Now that shift occurred in the developed world way back, back in the first half of the century. In the developing world, it still hasn't quite happened. We still have less than 50% of the developing world living in urban populations. But that process, round about 2020, 2025, we'll see that number tick over too. So more people, older people, more urbanized people. Demographic building block. Second big building block to this is what's happening to the world economy, to economic growth, if you like. Um, now, I don't know if you've seen, there's a, a book that's been appearing in the uh, non-fiction bestseller list by Ian Morris, you know, Why the Rest Rules for Now. And um, I've just started reading this, so I haven't got to the end, but you know, he, he begins with this kind of interesting little bit of alternative history. He imagines it's the 1840s, and there's Chinese gunboats sailing up the Thames, um, ready to take obeisance from a Queen Victoria and impose a Chinese governor on the United Kingdom. And of course, he says, well, in fact, what happens at this time in history is almost precisely the reverse. Um, the gunboats are going in the other direction. And he asks the question, well, why is this? Um, and his answer, and I'm very, you know, I'm early in there, but his answer seems to be geographical, which is coined in the phrase that all the reviewers like, which is maps, not chaps, which is kind of quite nice and catchy. But of course, the, the, the proximate or the short term answer to this is its economics. Um, the world economy, until around about 1800, is growing either, if you're a Malthusian, very slowly, or if you're an Adam Smith disciple, it's growing a bit more quickly than that, but it's pretty slow, grinding, painful growth. Around about the 1800s, same time as that demographic transition kicks off, not coincidentally, round about that point, modern economic growth, increases in rapid wealth per capita, kicks in in Northern Europe. And we get a takeoff. So Economic GDP per capita, wealth per headline, which have been, if not flatlining, but have been pretty flat and you know, uninspiring, spike very sharply upwards at around this point. What's critical for the future of the world economy and for the future of world politics for the next couple of centuries is that this doesn't happen everywhere. 
It happens in North, North Europe, and then it spreads across around the Atlantic economies, and then it gradually filters out. And we get what some economic historians have called a great divergence, which is this splitting in economic performance. Some countries get wealthier very quickly, others lag behind. The, the second sort of big dramatic historical event that's changing our world now is that this great divergence that has shaped our world is being replaced by a great convergence. After more than a century of subpar economic performance, the big billion people plus Asian economies, China, India, have entered onto the modern economic growth path. Now, they, they did this at various times. We've seen precursors of this. If we look around East Asia, we've seen Korea, Japan tread this path before. But we've now moved since around about 2000. There's been a growth, a growth gap opened up between developed and developing economies, between four, four and a half percentage points per annum. And as a result of that, all of those consequences of that great divergence, which shaped the world economy and an international economic and political order um, that we've grown used to and grown comfortable with, are starting to be changed. We're starting to see that process, the gap between those two economies narrow. And what's striking and particularly important about this is the pace at which it's happening. You know, the UK during the Industrial Revolution, at its height of economic success, manages 2% per annum economic growth. Now, this is fantastic compared to a world economy that's stuck in something that looks a bit like a Malthusian trap. This is rocket, rocket speed growth. But it takes you about 75 years at that pace of growth. So it takes you about 35 years at that pace of growth to double the size of your economy. The US, when it gets growing a bit later in the 19th century, opening up that western frontier, it's growing at maybe 4% per annum. So it's doubling the UK rate. Still takes you about 17 years to double the size of your economy at that. China, since 1980, has grown at a roughly 10% per annum. That means you can double your economy every seven years. So the pace of transition is historically unprecedented. Almost. As I said, we've seen it with a Japan or a Korea, but the big difference now is 10% per annum on top of 1.3 billion people, on top of a country that's in an, uh, an intermediate part of that demographic transition. That reshapes your global economy for you. If you project that out further and look at India, say, which is doing 6 to 7%, so slower than China, but still enough to double its economy every 11 or 12 years, and you look at some other big emerging markets, the product of that, if you assume that this kind of trend continues, is that global income distribution, how many rich people, how many poor people you have in the world economy, shifts radically. If you thought about graphing global income distribution with the numbers of people up on the vertical axis and then along the bottom one, how much income they have, are they poor, are they middle class, are they wealthy? You know, pre this great convergence process, you have a big hump right at the lower end, most people are pretty poor in the world economy, and then a smaller hump at the upper end where the rich world lives. This great convergence process means that that big hump at the bottom end shunts gradually across. By 2020, 2030, 2040, we live in a world economy that looks like a middle class world economy. The bulk of the world's population have middle incomes, generously defined as middle incomes, but middle incomes nonetheless. Um, and if you look similarly at the list of the world's top 10 largest economies as you run through that process, instead of them being the world's richest economies, you get it splitting out. You still have some rich economies in there, but increasingly you get middle income economies too. So you end up, as a result of this convergence process, as a middle income world in two senses. The world's population, richer on average, and the size, and the, and the, the world's most important economies, more of them will be middle income economies. So more people, older people, more urbanized people, wealthier people, standard, is, the, is our sort of base case scenario for coming decades. On average, average create obviously hides huge discrepancies, on average. I did warn, I'm doing big picture and hand waving. This is taking a get place against the context of globalization. So that means that those impacts, that increase in economic growth, that urbanization, industrialization, spills across borders even more than it would have normally. It's taking place against the backdrop of a much more integrated world economy. Um, we basically tie work